The six o'clock news starts right she now. She was innocent. She couldn't defend herself. She was five years old. What could Mercedes do? Nothing. A life sentence handed down in court, but still a grieving family believes that justice will never be served. We're hearing tonight from the family of five-year-old Mercedes Losoya, who died from abuse at the hands of her mother and her mother's boyfriend. A little over a week ago, Jose Ruiz was given a life sentence in this case, and soon Mercedes' mom, Katrina Mendoza, will find out her own fate. Erica Hernandez met with the family, who for the first time is sharing how they tried to save Mercedes. Me, me. These are the moments and memories Lorraine and Emily have left of Mercedes. Oh, oh! She would tell me, jam off. I said, yes, I love you with all my heart. And then she would blink her eyes. The grandmother and aunt said they tried to get Katrina Mendoza to leave her daughters Jordan and Mercedes with them. And she did for a while until the day before Thanksgiving in 2021. I even cried outside. Katrina, let me have the girls, let them stay here tomorrow's day. Not because of the honor of my mom, I need to take the girls and never saw Mercedes again. Emily, concerned with the well-being of the girls, called CPS on several occasions. But at the trial, it was revealed despite having numerous filings against Mendoza, the kids were never removed. During trial, the grandmother and aunt, along with other family members, saw the video and photos that Ruiz took of himself abusing Mercedes and the aftermath. It's just the video was just so hard for me to watch. Like strangers that were in the courtroom or people that were watching in, yeah. they had more of a reaction to watching that video than she did. Mendoza is scheduled to be sentenced on April 29th. The maximum per the plea deal is 45 years. A plea deal, they say, they told the district attorney's office they didn't want. I say you should have caught contact us first before you gave her. I said, but you never did. I said, why? Because 45 or probation, that's a slap on my face. Will there ever be justice for Mercedes? She didn't choose to die. No. So I don't think there will ever be justice ever for her. be justice. No matter what, I'm just gonna leave it in God's hands. She's gonna pay. Mm. Sitting in that jail, she's gonna, or uh, in prison, her day's coming in his days. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Now Mercedes' older sister, Jordan, she's been adopted. She's now with her great-grandmother, and the family tells us that she's doing well. A former teacher at Comfort High School is accused of having an inappropriate relationship with a student and giving that student a morning after pill. According to an arrest affidavit, 38 year old Ty Rex Road had a physical relationship with a student and she was afraid that she could get pregnant. Rex Road is also accused of talking with other female students via Snapchat and investigators believe they have found another student who was being groomed by Rex Road. More charges could be coming, according to Kendall County authorities. Comfort ISD says that Rex Road taught at the high school for two years, but resigned this past February. His bond is set at $600,000. Why didn't he get out alive? That's what fire investigators want to know about a man who was found dead inside of his burning home. So let's go back. Neighbors had noticed the flames and the smoke right there coming from the home around 930 this morning. Then they called 911. Firefighters say that after they arrived there, uh, that the man who used a wheelchair to get around, they were told that he might still be inside that home. It's in the 4000 block of Commercial Avenue near Gillette Boulevard. Firefighters say before they got to go inside, they had to first beat back the flames in the front room. The victim was located near that same area. Um, don't know if, uh, if, the, uh, if the victim was always in a wheelchair, just needed it for to ease of access. The medical examiner says that the victim was 67 years old. Six months ago, the San Antonio City Council approved a new and controversial reproductive justice fund as part of its annual budget. Abortion rights advocates and some council members say that that fund could help to cover travel costs for women getting legal abortions out of state. Here's the thing, though. The city has yet to define exactly what it would cover. Even so, anti-abortion groups quickly sued the city. Our Garrett Berger was there as that case finally made its way into a courtroom. In September, the half-million-dollar fund played an oversized part in San Antonio's multi-billion-dollar budget vote. Reproductive Justice Fund. The Reproductive Justice Fund. The Reproductive Justice Fund. Though the city council approved money for the fund, it hasn't decided how that money will be spent. But anti-abortion groups think it's clear. 
It's meant to assist with accessing abortion. And in October, they sued. We think eventually that's what's going to take place. Incrementally, they're going to do that, yes. Uh, how they do it, how they go about that, how they do it legally, I don't know. But that is exactly the purpose for our, our case, is to stop it from happening. The city is trying to get the case dismissed, arguing there's nothing yet for the groups to sue about. The city could make any number of decisions about what to do with the Reproductive Justice Fund. It could decide to spend money on prenatal care, maternal health services, education, postpartum care. Abortion care is just one of many possibilities. Possibilities that more than six months after the budget passed still haven't been narrowed down. Though the city attorney believes that's because the council has had other priorities it wanted to look at first. I would say it had nothing to do with the ongoing lawsuit. The city council is expected to be briefed in about two weeks on possible uses for the funds at a discussion only April 10th meeting. But they won't actually vote until later when contracts are ready to be approved. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The driver of a concrete truck that caused a deadly crash with a school bus near Bastrop last week did cocaine the morning of the crash and smoked weed the night before. His name is Jerry Hernandez. That information coming out in court records the same day that video of that crash was released. And it's hard to watch. On the left side of the screen there, you'll see the concrete truck come into view. It clips the school bus. The bus flips and it rolls over after the impact. Now we stopped the video there, being mindful and respectful to the fact that two lives were lost in this crash. Five-year-old Ulysses Rodriguez Montoya was one of the two people killed. What the video does not show is a car that hit the back of this bus. The driver of that car, 33-year-old Ryan Wallace, was also killed. In all, 53 people were hurt in this crash, and the bus did not have seatbelts. We want to invite you to stick around through our next half hour because we have Doc Talk coming up at 6.30. We're getting your questions answered with University Health. We're going to talk about prediabetes weight gain, kidney transplants, and colorectal cancer. That, my friends, is coming up in less than 30 minutes. I think a lot of people need to be held accountable within Atascosa County and immediately. A former vet tech is accusing Atascosa County's animal control chief of ignoring animal welfare concerns. John Pena believes that he was retaliated against for speaking up. So now he's suing the county and the city of Pleasanton. As Pena tells our Daniela Ibarra, he's hoping that this case leads to accountability. What does this job cost you? <laughs> this job specifically has costs nearly everything. John Pena was hired as a vet tech with Atascosa County Animal Control in February of 2022. He says tension started building in June of 2022. What did you see? <laughs> I saw a lot. Oh, we're friendly now, huh? In a lawsuit filed now? in February of this year, Pena says he raised concerns about what he believes was improper euthanization. I started noticing there was a trend of that. And I finally drew the line when 22 cats were put down in one weekend just a day or two after they had arrived at our facility. Benya says he spoke with the county's animal control chief, Henry Dominguez. He um, basically said that this was a common thing at the facility, that this was a bleeding heart thing that I had going on. I cared too much for these animals. In the lawsuit, Benya accuses Dominguez of allowing employees to violate the department's policy on how to treat animals. He says a fellow vet tech failed to feed dogs and he claims Dominguez threatened him with criminal charges for planning to get a foster cat spayed. Every day was something new. Benya left the county in May of 2023 to work as a kennel manager for the city of Pleasanton. A few months later, he claims Dominguez conspired to get him fired by threatening to terminate a contract. It was retaliation all the way through. In August, the Texas Attorney General's office found no evidence of criminal wrongdoing by Dominguez or animal control. What do you hope comes with this lawsuit? I really want it to be a landmark case in the state of Texas. And I know that's a stretch, but I really want it to be something that people look back on and say, hey, let's look at this case to see how these animals were treated and how we can fix this. Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. Now, the city of Pleasanton declined to comment on this lawsuit, and we did reach out to Henry Dominguez with Atascosa County Animal Control six times over the past three weeks, and we never heard back. 
Now taking a live look at our roads right now and boy oh boy is there some traffic to tell you about right here. This is a uh, loop 410 at Blanco Road where you can see that that exit ramp right there to get off uh, loop 410 is just stalled. I mean cars are really down to a crawl. Uh, this right here is Highway 35 at the Frost Bank Center and yeah that traffic is moving but it is very slow at this hour. Let's take another look outside with live cam. Not a cloud in the sky today. It was beautiful, but it got a little toasty this afternoon, Adam. Yeah, that big temperature range. Yeah, a bit of a chill earlier this morning with temperatures down in the 40s, 45 officially at the airport. And then by the afternoon, we made it to 80 degrees. That time of year, you need to dress in layers. Sweatshirt in the morning, short sleeves and shorts are fine by the afternoon. Look at the record 100 setback in 1971. That just shows you the potential for this time of year. Right now we're at 79, but a dew point of 46. So that dry feel to the air, crisp feel to the air. Notice that southeasterly wind at 13. That's going to pick up a little bit later this evening. It'll be steady out of the southeast at about 10 to 20 miles per hour with some higher gusts. Temperatures, though, near average. 65 at 10 o'clock midnight, we're at 60 degrees. And the humidity soon returns, making it feel spring-like this weekend. It's also going to have a few more implications. And then a cold front greets us early next week. We'll talk about it all in just a bit. All right, thank you. Now still ahead, the April 8th eclipse. Did you know that's coming? Yeah, it's going to be here soon. What one astronaut is hoping this is going to do for the field of astronomy. Plus, the huge donation goal the San Antonio Food Bank is hoping to reach for the Battle of Flowers 133-year anniversary. Next. One San Antonio chef is helping to reimagine an American fast food classic. So coming up tonight on the Night Beat, we're walking you through how this all happened and how you could see a San Antonio spin on the Crunchwrap. I am like on this uh, wave of love, Viva Amor in 2024. And that is the motto for this year's Battle of Flowers Parade. What better way to show some love than with some food? Of course, the best way. Yeah, and as the 2024 Battle of Flowers Grand Marshal, San Antonio Food Bank CEO Eric Cooper, you just saw there, he says it's all about helping, serving, and connecting with the community. And he tells KSET that he has a huge goal in mind. Listen to this, and that is collecting 1.33 million pounds of food, and that's to coincide with the parade's 133-year anniversary. Bringing the community together is that tradition of Battle of Flowers. Oftentimes, when you get together, you have food. Making sure that families across our city are nourished, those that are struggling, you know, whether it's a senior, a child, a family, um, it's such a privilege to provide the food that they need to nourish themselves. Let's keep that tradition alive, San Antonio. Yeah, I like that idea. Now, if you want to help the San Antonio Food Bank's Fiesta Battle of Flowers campaign, look for red barrels. They're going to be all across the city. You can also donate to safoodbank.org. And did you have your Fiesta calendar ready yet? The Battle mm. of Flowers Parade is April 26th, of course. Stick with us. The KSAT, the official Fiesta station, for your chance to ride in the Battle of Flowers Parade. All you have to do is scan this QR code here to submit your entry. So just to let you know, you're going to be asked to become a KSAT insider, which is free. And then you can share your story about why you love the Battle of Flowers Parade so much. By the way, your answer could win you a chance to ride on a float. So that's really important there. Good luck. Now, before uh, we get to Fiesta, of course, we have to go through the eclipse, <laughs> which is obviously a lot of people here are excited about. Yeah, we got a lot on our plate. A lot of exciting mm -hmm. things happening. Less than two weeks now, people from all over the world, including astronauts, some who've been out of this world, they'll, coming, they'll be coming to South Texas to get a view of the total solar eclipse. And that includes veteran astronaut Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Now, she is the first Latina astronaut to go into space. In an interview with Tiffany Huertas, she shares what she hopes comes from this once-in-a-lifetime event. Listen, because right here we're going to show you a clip from their conversation. What can we learn from this total solar eclipse coming to Texas? First of all, I, I hope it gets people interested in what astronomy can teach us about how all the objects, uh, and particularly the ones that we 
see every day, right? The sun and the moon, um, as well as the earth, how they sort of interact, um, learn a little bit more about orbital dynamics. I love the hair in space. Mm. That's volume <laughs> right there. The total solar eclipse is April 8th. As your eclipse authority, KSAT all day long on the 8th has coverage going on, and we have everything you need to know leading up to that event. Yeah. And weather plays a huge role. I know. We're yes. all wondering what that's going to be like, and <sighs> it's sky. stressing Adam Kasky out. <laughs> Yeah. It's already been stressing me out. Now, climatologically <laughs> speaking, we have the best odds of a clear sky along the path of totality here in the U.S. But with the pattern that we've had, we get these periods of one to two days of clouds and then some clearing and it's cyclical. And it's I think it could be a close call and we really won't know for sure until a day or two in advance what's going to be in our sky, if anything, and where and how much of it. It's still too early to tell. And I know the information exists out there. You can find it, but it's trash. If you go by that forecast, you're, you're messing everything. And seriously, it's garbage. It's, it's garbage this far out. Meteorologically, we're just not there yet. I know we can get information in an instant. We've got these fancy phones and all this stuff, but as a science of meteorology, no, we're not there yet, okay? I'm going to get off my soapbox, maybe. It, it needed to be said. <laughs> Yes, we're not there. Otherwise, I'd have it for you. All right, take a look if there was any certainty in it. Okay, take a look at our dew point forecast because deweys are arising. It's going to feel like spring. Dew points back into the 60s, even pushing 70 degrees by Monday. So this weekend and early next week, you'll feel the mugginess back in the air. Then notice how those dew points fall off by Tuesday of next week behind a cold front. So a little bit of... Something for everybody. If you like the humidity, you'll like this weekend and Monday. If you don't, next week will feel a lot like what we've had lately. Now, notice the wind gusts as we go through the evening, up to 20 miles per hour, even 25 in spots. A little bit breezy this evening, nothing excessive. You don't have to worry about your recycling bin or your green bin or your trash bin. Just a little breezy out there. And tomorrow, you'll, you'll notice that wind as well, gusting at times. 25 to 30 miles per hour. Now here's the key. The wind is coming out of the south southeast coming off the Gulf of Mexico, pushing some of that Gulf moisture into town. And other than feeling the humidity like we talked about this weekend, I think we'll see it in the form of reduced visibility, some fog. So fog and mist tomorrow morning. Notice our future cast is even picking up on it under a mile visibility at times for the morning commute starting about 5 a.m. lasting through 8 a.m. and then the fog lifts and we'll have sunshine. So early tomorrow on Good Friday we'll have some of that patchy fog, but I don't think it's going to be too problematic. 55 degrees, 73 at noon, then 79 back up near 80 for the high temperature with a lot of sunshine later in the day. Making it to 81 in Divine tomorrow, 77 Bulverde, 79 Seguin and Converse. As we go into the Easter weekend, morning fog again Saturday and Sunday. So Easter Sunday morning, just that foggy dampness, a little bit of mist out there, but no real rain to make things super soggy. Catch my drift. One of those situations, kind of like what we had last Sunday. Honestly, the high temperatures will be back into the low to mid 80s. That's for this weekend and even Monday. But I mentioned that cold front that arrives and notice how that drops our highs back below average by the middle of next week. Next Wednesday and Thursday, we're talking low 70s for afternoon highs. Now, one thing we're looking for too is rain. That's what we need. You look at the current drought situation. This was updated earlier today. Every Thursday it's updated and we still have the severe and extreme drought, especially in parts of the Hill Country and Western Bear County. And we have some of the worst drought in all of Texas right here in our backyard. 24% of the state is in drought. Our next system is off in the Pacific. This beautiful swirl you see here moving towards Seattle and Portland. That's going to throw some energy and that cold front our way by Monday evening and Monday night. But overall potential is pretty limited. I mean, even all around Texas as a whole, the next seven days, we're not looking at much in terms of rainfall potential overall. So that's a 30% chance late Monday and Monday night. And then behind it, Look at that next week. I mean, sunny skies. If we can't get rain, at least it's going to be comfortable and pleasant and good for any visitors that are in town. Yeah, for sure. We'll have a few. Thanks, Adam.
Things are not so sunny, unfortunately, for Astros fans. No, tough start to opening yeah. day for the Astros. I mean, they had a good start, but then unfortunately let it slip away. They fall to the Yankees. We'll see what the Rangers can do as they prepare to host Chicago on opening day and defend their crown. Plus, San Antonio FC is all smiles, fresh off of a clean sheet performance. We're also talking about that Spurs win right after the break. The Texas Rangers are minutes away from trying to become the first club in 24 consecutive seasons to win back-to-back -back World Series championships. Last season's path to glory saw the Rangers go 90 and 72 with a second place finish in the American League West. They swept the Rays and Orioles before outlasting the Astros in the ALCS, then beat the Diamondbacks in five games to win their first World Series title in franchise history. Bruce Bochy was confident this time last year and says he is again this year. The Rangers open their season at 635 against the Chicago Cubs at Globe Life Field. Texas native Nathan Evaldi gets the opening day start for the Rangers and Justin Steele will counter for Chicago. Well, after jumping out to a 4-0 lead, the Houston Astros fall to the New York Yankees 5-4. Houston's pitchers allowed nine walks and eight hits. Yankees' Juan Soto era begins strong. Well, since the All-Star break, the San Antonio Spurs have taken strides in the right direction, and one measure of success has been the consistent play of 23-year-old guard Devin Vassell. Last night, Vassell notched his 18th 25-plus point game, dropping 31 points to lead San Antonio to a 118-111 to win over Utah. Vassell was also a disruption on the defensive end for San Antonio amidst a very efficient shooting night, and his teammates took notice. More and more he's becoming a real problem for defenses. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's beautiful to see him evolve like this throughout the year. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many 30-point games he's had, but lately he's, or 25-plus, you know, he's had a lot. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we have to know our, our, strength, our strengths and what we want to develop, and he's a big part of it, so all of us trust him. The Spurs are eyeing three straight wins when the Knicks visit town tomorrow, but New York has only lost three games this month. Tip-off is at 7 o'clock from Frost Bank Center. San Antonio FC captured its first win of the season after starting the year with two draws, 2-0 two against Colorado Switchbacks FC over the weekend. SAFC defender Lucas Silva and goalkeeper Pablo Cisniaga were named to the USL Championship Team of the Week and Alan Marcina, Coach of the Week, for their efforts to keep the clean sheet. This Saturday at 7.30, the club will host a tough Monterey Bay FC team. But SAFC finally breaking into the win column should give them plenty confidence entering the match. I mean, we work hard as well off the ball. So to get a clean sheet with the win, it means, it means a lot. Almost as equivalent as the win, if you'd ask me. But I mean, if they come together, it's perfect. They're unbeaten, just like us. So um, obviously they're going they're playing pretty well right now, and um, they're gonna come in here wanting to remain unbeaten. So um, just like us, we want to remain unbeaten. So um, yeah, we have to bring it on Saturday and um, give us give us our best game. Love seeing the hard work pay off for SAFC. They gotta bring it. All right. Yes. Thank you. Coming up next, we're getting answers to your medical questions. Doc Talk is right after the break. So it is about that time, my friends, Doc Talk. Once a week, we take the questions that you send us and we pass them on to a doctor or medical professional. Yeah, joining us live today to answer your questions is Dr. Leo Lopez with University Health. Dr. Lopez, thanks for being back. Happy to be back. Okay, so let's start with our first viewer question. This one was sent to us anonymously. It says, three months ago, I was diagnosed as pre-diabetic. Oh, excuse me, Rebecca, she's put her name on here. I, she says I had breast cancer in 2019 and was cleared in 2022. I feel my body has changed a lot like weight gain. I've been the perfect weight over 25 years. What can I do? Percy, uh, thank you, Rebecca, for sharing your story. And um, I'm glad to hear uh, it sounds like um, things have gotten better um, with your uh, breast cancer. So just wanted to acknowledge that. 
Uh, but yes, let's talk about prediabetes. Um, it's really important. Uh, this is um, affecting millions of people across the U.S. In fact, about 100 million Americans have prediabetes, uh, including one in three people right here in Bear County. But about 80% of folks don't know they have it at all. Uh, and it's really important um, that we recognize that prediabetes increases our risk of things like type 2 diabetes, uh, heart disease, and strokes. Uh, so often we've talked about right here um, on Doc Talk that prediabetes, the good news is it's reversible. Uh, if we can aim to lose about 5 to 10% of our body weight in the next uh, year, uh, we can potentially reverse prediabetes. Uh, and the, the fundamentals are, as we've discussed, that commitment to nutrition. Uh, we want to try and incorporate um, at least five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Uh, try to avoid those processed fast foods. Uh, and if you're looking for more structure and guidance, uh, look to something like the Mediterranean diet. There's good principles, uh, tips, and strategies there that can be really healthy for us. And the other part of it is um, exercise. Mm -hmm. um, for adults, we want to try and get 150 minutes per week. Uh, that's something as simple as a walk, 20 minutes every day or 30 minutes every five days. Uh, and then we want to stress, uh, manage our stress uh, and get good quality sleep. For adults, again, about mm -hmm. seven to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. So if, people, if a lot of people don't know that they have prediabetes, what are the signs of that? What should we be looking for? Sure, so sometimes there are no uh, signs at all. Um, so we wanna, if you are uh, concerned about uh, your weight um, or really just concerned about your health, generally speaking, connect with your doctor, see about getting screened for diabetes. And um, there are different um, options out there for screening. Uh, so definitely recommend folks reconnect with their healthcare team. All right, okay. now let's move on to the next question. It comes from Olivia M. She says, my fingers on my right hand keep locking and they hurt very bad. How do I prevent this? Thank you for the question, Olivia. Um, so it's, uh, without doing a, a history physical and knowing much about the, the uh, medical history, um, I couldn't say for certain what you're going through, but it sounds like you might um, uh, have something called a trigger finger. Uh, and trigger finger um, is a problem with the tendons um, in our hand. Uh, it affects uh, about 2% um, of the population, so um, fairly common uh, for folks. The frustrating thing is we often don't know what causes it. Um, it's, it can happen spontaneous without uh, an injury or really anything that we can point to. Um, we do tend to see it uh, in patients that have diabetes or a certain type of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh -huh. um, so if this is trigger finger, there are a few things that uh, you can work um, with your doctor on. Um, typically we start with things like um, pain and um, anti-inflammation medications, some splinting um, on the affected uh, finger as well. If that's not working, a next step would be something like a steroid shot or injection. Um, and then if a few of those aren't working, you can talk to your um, hand specialist or your doctor about surgical procedures as well. But I will say it's important to make sure that it isn't anything else because um, there's certain mm -hmm. types of um, hand infections, um, arthritis, and other types of conditions that can also look a lot like trigger finger. Oh, okay. okay. So let's talk now about colon cancer. It's the time okay. of year, the, the month where we try to raise awareness about that, inform people. So a question here, should I be screened for colorectal cancer? Yes, uh, you're right. Um, this is a National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, uh, and we know that colorectal cancer screenings save lives. Um, and the sad reality is that uh, colorectal cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer deaths um, right here in the U.S. Um, so if you're 45 years or older, uh, get with your doctor uh, and get screened for uh, colorectal cancer. Um, there are many um, options out there. Uh, some are stool-based uh, testing, um, some that you can even complete in your home and mail off to a lab. Uh, but our gold standard is uh, the colonoscopy. Um, this is uh, a lighted tube that can um, look on the inside of the, of the colon. Um, and uh, if, it, I, if we see any signs of precancer or these um, growths, not only can you identify them, but you can potentially you can remove them. Um, and that's what we want to work for is to try and prevent cancer um, and try to identify it in an early stage where treatment is more effective. Are those the only two options? 
There aren't. There are, there are a few others. In fact, in the stool, in the stool studies, uh, the stool-based studies, there are a few um, that folks can connect with their doctor on to learn a little bit more about those mm -hmm. details. There's also another um, type of, that's called a sigmoidoscopy, similar to a colonoscopy, but doesn't get the entire view um, of the colon. And then there's um, what we can call kind of like a, a virtual colonoscopy that uses things like um, x-rays to create a, a digital image um, of the colon. And you were saying before that it's younger people that you're finding. Well, we are more diagnosed with this. Uh, yeah, I do want to, to ensure that we are, um, you know, connecting um, with with the younger folks, particularly uh, my generation, the millennials. Uh, what we've what we've seen um, from the mid '90s to now is that uh, it's been about a two percent increase um, in cancer, uh, in colorectal cancer, in those under 50 years of age. Um, so, if you have um, risk factors, things like uh, having a family member who has colorectal cancer, um, or you're concerned about it connect with your doctor because you might benefit from screening at a younger age. And especially for the younger folks, you say the word colonoscopy. Mm. People get a little worried about that. Mm -hmm. It does not sound pleasant. But what would you tell somebody about what this procedure really involves and, you know, especially any kind of recovery afterwards? Sure. What I would say is the colonoscopy is such a powerful tool that has the ability to save lives. Um, and sure, I know folks are concerned about um, taking the, the prep work um, before and, and that may be causing some, some uh, discomfort. Um, but the, the reality is this can save lives. Definitely connect with your healthcare team uh, to see about getting your screening for colorectal cancer. Do we know why this is happening, why so many people are being diagnosed with this? That's an excellent question, um, particularly on, on the younger folks. Um, scientists are working hard to try and find some answers. There are a few, op uh, a few opinions and theories uh, that are being tested. We don't know for sure, um, but folks are, are on the case and exploring that question. Okay, All thank right. you. Yeah, Dr. Lopez, thanks for joining us as always. Thank you for having me. See you me. next time here on Doc Talk. And if you have a question, let us know. You can go to our website, scan this QR code here, or send us your questions. We take them straight to doctors to bring you answers. We do this every Thursday right here at 630. All right, still ahead here on the show, we're talking money. Okay, what sounds better, 900 million or 400 million? Still more than what I have. Isn't it nice to have options? <laughs> it's a question a lot of people may be asking themselves or dreaming about when they play the lottery. We're gonna talk about it in the buzz. All right, welcome back. We wanna take things outside and show you this nice picture of here. Oh God, look at that sky, how pretty is it? Clear and blue, 79 degrees out there right now. Uh, we have to remember that it is Holy Thursday. Tomorrow's Good Friday. We've got a lot of events happening this weekend, so we're going to want to keep this weather going. Yeah, and there will be some noticeable spring-like changes into this upcoming holiday weekend, and then things get reversed again <laughs> into next week because we have another cold front headed our way. Right now, we're still near 80 at 79. By 9 o'clock, we're at 68. Comfortable, pleasant, and seasonable. Right near average overnight tonight. But the wind will be noticeable. Right now, it's steady out of the southeast at 13 miles per hour. It's going to be a little breezy tonight, and even tomorrow, we'll talk more about what that breeze is going to mean in terms of humidity and other impacts in just a bit. A lot to talk about in the Easter weekend forecast, but first, did you see it yesterday? A lot of people did, including those kids behind you. This yeah. is a great picture. Oh, it was so vibrant. We were greeted with just such wonderful rainbows all across our area that people could see and it, very, very vibrant colors. And it was a perfect combination of the low angle sun in the evening and the passing rain that we had and clearing right after. And we shared a lot of photos on from KSAC Connect on the night beat last night, but I just saw this one pop up and <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love our KSAT viewers. Take it at the Westover Hill Sports Complex. Grandkids enjoying the pleasant weather and the double bow behind him as well. And remember, you can only see a rainbow if your back is toward the sun. Exactly. You back, have taught me that. Yep, your back has to be to the sun in order to uh, see a rainbow. That's why they always appear in the same spot when you have an evening rainbow. For here at KSAT, it's always over the. Uh, Art Museum, San Antonio Art Museum, that's just behind us. Anyway, let's talk about the morning temperature trend. I mentioned earlier, you know, the humidity is working its way back in. Feeling more spring-like, sticky, muggy, and warmer this weekend. And that humidity will lead to some morning fog every day, Friday through Monday. But also, warmer mornings, back into the 60s, even near 70 on Monday morning. But don't put the jackets away quite yet. You'll still want the sweatshirts or the jackets at the bus stop 
for part of next week. Cold front hits on Monday night. Behind it, temperatures fall off and we'll even have some mornings back down into the 40s by the middle part of next week. Currently, it's comfortable outside. Across the state, mostly 70s and 80s. Del Rio, 86, 72, Dallas, Midland at 76. Castroville, 82, and currently Bernie, one of the cooler exceptions at 73. Temperatures falling off pretty efficiently this evening as we have the clear sky, we've got low humidity, and winds aren't too excessive right now, but we will settle down in the mid-50s to start the day tomorrow, which is average for this time of year, 55 degrees in San Antonio. By noon, we're up to 73. 5 o'clock, we're 79. Back up near 80. We'll have some of that patchy fog in the morning up through 9 a.m., and then we clear out and have sunshine with a bit of a breeze out of the south at 10 to 20. Not too humid tomorrow, still feeling pleasant, but you'll really notice the humidity into the weekend. Along the Rio Grande tomorrow, mid 80s, even 87 in Del Rio, 88 Carrizo Springs in Catula as warm as 88 degrees. Meanwhile, Lavernia 81 and Stone Oak 81 as well. The humidity is really back and it's going to be at some of the highest levels that we've well, the highest levels that we haven't seen in some time with dew points closer to 70 on Sunday and even into Monday. So you'll notice that stickiness and the extra frizz in the hair for Easter Sunday. Also a little bit of dampness from the morning fog, but afternoons are in the 80s. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Then that cold front hits, and Monday night, 30% chance of a few showers and storms Monday evening and Monday night. Unfortunately, that's our only shot at rain anytime soon. But notice how those temperatures fall off. We talked about the mornings back in the 40s, afternoons in the lower 70s by Wednesday and Thursday. The countdown, it's on 11 days until the total solar eclipse. Now, this is a fact, and this is why the total solar eclipse is so important. If you are in the path of totality, which is not our whole area, but we have all the information you need at kset.com, shortly after the diamond ring disappears, you can briefly remove your eclipse glasses. But you have to be in totality. 99.9% .9 is not good enough. You have to be within 100% totality. We've got these maps on ksat.com and notice how it just goes right through San Antonio. The airport is barely in totality. Uh, McAllister Park is barely in totality. Castle Hills, Leon Valley, SeaWorld just within totality. And of course, we have more of this information on ksat.com. Now, <laughs> speaking of... Eclipse and Therm Thurs. It wouldn't be appropriate to come upon such a big, major celestial event <laughs> around here without a commemorative thermometer to go with it. And this is the thermometer. This is one of the thermometers I'll be giving away next week. I've been prepping them, got them engraved, getting them prepped. You got the path there of totality going through Texas. You can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. They still need thermometers on them. I, I realize that, but I'm going to put the <laughs> thermometers from the panhandle all the way down to Big Bend so it doesn't cover up the path of totality. So I'm just letting you know I've been prepping. I've been getting them ready. We will have a commemorative thermometer to give away next week before Very cool. we get into the eclipse. And my Fiesta medals are in. They have to do with the eclipse. So we'll get to that after the we'll get later on. Adelaide Robinson of San Antonio, the winner of a homemade thermometer. It's not the commemorative one for the eclipse. That one I'll just be giving away once. It is a one of a kind next week, next Thursday, kset.com slash thermometer. Now I'm all excited. There's a lot going on <laughs> at that weather up. center. A lot. A lot going on. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you, you, Adam. The buzz is next. In the buzz today, they left, they came back, and now they're leaving San Antonio again. That's right. Kroger says it's going to shut down its delivery facilities in San Antonio, Austin, and South Florida because they just didn't meet the benchmarks set for success. Kroger's San Antonio delivery facility, by the way, is on the northeast side. It opened back in 2022, and it was Kroger's first return to the Alamo City in 30 years. You can still place online delivery orders with Kroger through May 25th. 
So no matter where you shop for Easter chocolate this year, you're probably going to notice, yeah, it's more expensive. Chocolate prices went up more than 11% in March of 2023, and it's not just inflation that is causing the increase. Experts are blaming weather conditions and also crop diseases in West Africa, which is where about 70% of the world's cocoa is produced. I didn't notice. Those bunnies, not cheap. <laughs> Good news for one Texan. According to the Texas Lottery, someone in the city of Flower Mound, northwest of Dallas, won a million bucks playing the Powerball last night. Oh, pretty lucky. The winning ticket was sold at a Kroger. And because nobody won the Powerball jackpot, the total now stands at... $935 million and counting. It's been growing since the last big win, which, by the way, was on New Year's Day. The next drawing is Saturday. And if you win, you can choose between two options to be paid over 30 years or a cash payout of about $449 million. Take the payout. We'll be right back. I'll take either.